Thank you. I appreciate the nice welcome. I am happy to be here. I'm based in the United States, but we our company, OC Tanner, has a, an office in Mumbai and also in Hyderabad. And so it was nice to come here and visit our employees. I've got 30 minutes to share with you everything I've learned in an entire career. Now, fortunately, I haven't learned much in my entire career, so 30 minutes may be actually be too long. So with that, if my slides are ready, we'll start. At the end of this, my slides, I'll give you my email address, so if you want my slides, just send me an email. A little bit about me. I've been doing IT and strategy turnarounds for about 20 years. I've written a couple of books about the methods and tools I've developed to do these turnarounds. I got into IT accidentally. I actually spent the early part of my career in engineering and project management. And the company I worked for, I spent most of my time complaining about how bad their IT was. So one day, just to get me to be quiet, they put me in charge of IT. And that's what I've done for the last 20 years. So with that, let's start. Here's the slide that I want you to remember. Of anything I show you, just remember this slide. It's this one. This is the definition of the digital transformation. Since the beginning of enterprise IT, the business defined its needs and IT supported those needs. That started to change five to eight years ago when advances in technology started to define what the business could and couldn't do. One of the questions I sometimes ask is, name for me any business innovation in the last 20 years that did not come from technology. Now, as a result of this digital transformation, where possibilities are created by the technology and the business then figures out how to use those technologies, things have changed. First of all, things change quickly because technology changes quickly. Secondly, because things change quickly, we live in a world of uncertainty and ambiguity. It's hard to know what the future holds. And the third thing is no matter what our organization does, every organization is rapidly becoming a technology organization where our customers and our employees judge us on the quality of our technology. Now internally, here are the implications for us and our employees. First of all, four categories of technology, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud, what we technologists call SMAC have changed the way we interact with each other, where we work, when we work, and have had the same impact in every aspect of our lives. These SMAC technologies have changed how work is done. And so that puts a lot of pressure on us as leaders in our organizations to understand how the, how the organization must change. How does social affect how we measure performance, how we organize teams? How does it change the leadership role? So I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the things we can do to better deal with that, not only better deal with it, but actually win in the marketplace in that environment. So here are my three guidelines for how to win in digital transformation. One, there are so many opportunities that are presented to us now through technology, we have to be careful to focus our innovation only on what creates competitive advantage for our organization. Along with that, because things are changing so quickly, we have to achieve operational excellence, but we do that by simplifying and standardizing our work rules and our processes because complexity and agility cannot coexist. If our processes and business rules are complex, we'll be slow. But we need to identify where the right opportunities are for simplification and standardization. And finally, we need to change our leadership role and our leadership model. Historically, our leadership model has been one of the heroic leader or the leader's decision maker and problem solver. 
in an environment where things change quickly, we need everybody to be a leader. We need everybody to be a problem solver. We need everybody to be a decision maker. So our leadership model must unleash talent. That's also the leadership model that attracts and retains people. So I'll talk specifically about those three things. And my starting point is a model I developed some years ago called purpose alignment. Purpose alignment helps us with the first two elements of the formula for digital transformation. Helps us identify where to focus our innovation and where to simplify and standardize everything else. It looks like this. It, using purpose alignment, we look at every activity we do in the enterprise in two dimensions. On the vertical axis, to what extent will that activity create competitive advantage? To what extent will it differentiate us in the marketplace? On the horizontal axis, to what extent will that activity, is that activity mission critical for our organization? When we look at our activities in those two dimensions, here are the results. The things that are both market differentiating and mission critical are the things that differentiate us in the marketplace. These are the things we need to do better than anyone else. These are the only things that deserve our innovation and creativity. Let me say that again. These are the only things that deserve our innovation and creativity. Almost everything else we do in the enterprise falls into the next category. Mission critical, vitally important, but will never create competitive advantage. These are the things we do that we must do, but they don't help us win in the marketplace. The goal for these is to achieve and maintain parity, to do these as well as everyone else. And in effect, to embrace the innovations of the market leaders. In a couple of slides, I'll give you some examples of that. On the left side of the model are the things that could create competitive advantage but are not mission critical for us. If those things exist and they're very rare, we find a partner and together and temporarily we form a partnership, an exclusive partnership, and we create competitive advantage together. But those are temporary and rare. Ultimately, we have to own the intellectual property that creates our competitive advantage. And finally, the ones that are neither differentiating nor mission critical, I call the who cares. These are the ones we want to minimize, and hopefully we don't have many of those in our organizations. These are the rules. For the differentiated activities, we want to innovate the thing we do better than anybody else over and over and over. It's critical that we continually innovate these activities. We also want to achieve a high level of focus. Every organization has at least one thing it does or should do better than anybody else. Might have two, possibly three. My personal rule of thumb is no one can achieve market differentiation if they're trying to do more than three things better than everybody else. And finally, we have to own these. Like I said, we can't outsource how we create competitive advantage. Now, the parity rules are very different. Remember, the goal of the parity rules is to do them as well as everyone else. So the first rule is we will adopt the best practices as defined by the market leaders. There's no economic benefit to doing parity things better than they have to be done, and somebody's already identified the right way to do them. Secondly, we want to simplify these activities. We want to reduce complexity. Complex things are risky, and complex things slow us down. Remember, complexity and agility cannot coexist. And finally, we want to standardize these activities to free up our resources so we can focus on how to create market innovation. That means, in practice, we want to minimize exception handling. We find the best way to do a parity activity, and we all do it that way. Let me give an example about O.C. Tanner. At O.C. Tanner, we're in the employee recognition business. 
That's the thing we strive to do better than anyone else. We work hard to innovate an employee recognition experience that directly leads to employee engagement. The other thing that's differentiated about us is our culture. We want to be the best place to work on the face of the earth. If those are our two differentiators, then everything else we do at OC Tanner, and we do lots of things, are in the parity category. We need to do them well, but we don't need to innovate those. Somebody's already figured out how to do these well. We just need to learn from them. So, in pra and then, once we've defined how OC Tanner creates competitive advantage, the next thing we do is cascade that into each department. So in the case of IT, what we did is we said if, we're, if OC Tanner's differentiator is employee recognition, what can we do in an innovative way, innovative way to directly support that? So we identified advanced analytics and what I call natural recognition as things we were going to do to help OC Tanner differentiate in the marketplace. We have some of the best employee data in the world. We've been doing employee recognition a long time. So if we could do advanced analytics, we could help our clients make the business case for recognition and engagement. I'll give you a quick example. For one of our clients, we did some machine learning analytics and found out that employee retention increases 16% if a manager in the employee's work group gives them formal recognition. I can turn that 16% improved retention into a business case for our HR clients. And then of course, if OC Tanner wants to be a great place to work, we do in IT as well. Everything else we do is parity. Doesn't mean it's unimportant. What it does tell us is how to do those things. Let me give you some examples. So here's some of the projects that we've been working on in our IT portfolio. One of them is order processing in e-commerce, replacing a highly customized system with a standard system. Why? Because people don't choose OC Tanner over all the alternatives, including doing it themselves or doing nothing on the basis of our innovative approach to placing an order. But it's mission critical. We must do it and must do it well. Let's go down to another one, which was an HRS HCM system. We wanted to do a project to replace a lot of manual HR processes. Those processes are mission critical for us, but not differentiating. Our culture is differentiating, not HR processes and transactions. So we replaced a lot of human activity and human workarounds with a zero customizations HRIS system. What that allowed our HR department to do, it freed them up to work on culture and leadership development rather than managing an exceptions-based employee transaction system. And like I said, we focused a lot of attention on what I call natural recognition. Let's make sure that recognition can happen in the work stream where people are working at that moment of time rather than having to go somewhere else to do recognition. And let's link that to analytics to help people make better decisions and build the business case for engagement and recognition. If you want to use this approach, all you have to do is identify the one, two, or three things that are in the differentiating category and assume everything else is parity. One of the tools I use to identify our one, two, or three differentiators is what I call the four important questions. The questions are one, who do we serve? Two, what do they need and want most? Third, what do we do better than anyone else to meet those needs and wants? And finally, fourth, what's the best way for us to provide those? If we can honestly ask and answer those questions, we'll identify what differentiates us in the marketplace. Okay, so let's say this is interesting to you. You want to do it. How do you do it? The next time you're making an important decision about a system or a process or doing your strategic planning, go through the exercise of asking those four questions, identifying what differentiates you in the marketplace, and then asking yourself, what can I do to, different, to innovate that 
process, that experience, that whatever. And then what are the opportunities to standardize and simplify everything else? And over time, you get to a higher state of performance because you're not spending your human capital in areas that don't generate value. Now let's talk about leadership. All of us, in whether we're in HR or in any leadership role, are in the culture business. My own personal experience is and belief is that organizational culture is defined by the leadership of the culture. And then inside of each organization, you have microcultures that are defined by the leaders in those departments. Well, we want every culture to be great which means we gotta focus some attention on what our culture is, but also the leadership role, because leadership defines culture. So I started thinking about what is a better way to think about leadership in the context of culture. And it occurred to me, maybe I need to rethink my leadership role. Instead of thinking I'm the one in charge, I am the primary decision maker, I'm the primary problem solver, maybe my job should be I'm the person who defines the culture of my organization, of my team, and maybe I can influence the culture of the organization as a whole. If that's the case, what culture do I want to create? And I started thinking about this notion of positional versus influential authority. I work in the IT department of OC Tanner. There are other departments at OC Tanner. I'm trying to help transform OC Tanner in a world of digital transformation. I have no positional authority over the CEO, over the board of directors, over those other departments. So if I want to get anything done, I'll do that through influential authority rather than positional authority. How do I achieve influential authority? So I thought more about it and thought about it from this perspective. Maybe as an influential leader, I'm somebody who's in that leadership role because I attract followers. Rather than being named into a position, I'm influential if people choose to follow me. Now, if that's true, then what does it take to gain followers? Why would somebody choose to follow me into the future? So I started thinking more and more about this notion of influential authority and my leadership role and my role in defining culture and started thinking about what type of leaders in the past and in the present have I chosen to follow and came up with this notion of this. As a leader, as an influential leader, the culture I want to create is one based on high trust and high ownership. So I came up with this trust ownership model that has heavily influenced how I approach my role. I want to build a culture that's high on trust rather than high on control. And is high on individual and team ownership for outcomes and results rather than low ownership. So I came up with these four types of conditions. The upper right one is where I want to be. If you've had a great experience following a great leader, you know they trusted you and you felt accountable and responsible for delivering results. You felt empowered, unleashed, engaged. That's where we want to be. The alternative is high control, low ownership. That's command and control. That's where the leader is there because they're the smartest person in the room or think they are. They're the primary decision maker. They're the primary, primary problem solver. They're gonna tell you not just what to do, but how to do it. The extreme case of command and control is micromanagement over in the lower left corner. And if you've ever been micromanaged, you know how terrible that is. Now, the other two sides of the model are if there's high trust but low accountability, then nothing gets done, that's apathy. And if there's low trust, meaning the leader wants to be in control, but so does the team because they have high levels of ownership, then there's conflict. Neither of those other two are sustainable. 
So the primary modes are command and control and where we want to be. So as a leader, I ask myself, this thing I'm about to do, will it improve trust and will it improve ownership? And if the answer is no, I stop myself. If the answer is yes, I do it. I ask myself all the time, will this improve trust? Will this improve ownership? Because that's the culture I want to create, because that's the great culture. So what do we do then as leaders? Two things, create a culture of trust and create a culture of ownership. And we create a culture of ownership by being in the why and what business, but never how. As soon as I tell somebody how to do anything, I took their ownership away. So let's go through a few things I've learned in my leadership roles that have helped me build a culture of trust and also a culture of ownership. We'll start with a culture of trust. An important lesson I've learned in helping build or trying to build a culture of trust is this notion of trust first. Trust first means I trust people implicitly rather than requiring them to prove to me that I can trust them. So I either trust first or I'm suspicious. I want to trust first and assume the best about people rather than the worst about people. Another thing I think is important is using team-based measurements that are based on outcomes. Ultimately, the metrics we put in place come from two sources. Do we keep our commitments and do people love to work with us? Because those are outcomes-based metrics not how-based metrics. I don't care how my teams keep their commitments or make it so people love to work with them. That's for them to figure out. So I'm not going to measure how. I'm only going to measure outcomes. Another thing is I've got to build confidence because I want my teams to grow. One of the best ways to build confidence is through short iterations with early wins. If a task is difficult, if it's challenging, I want to set up my teams for success by breaking that difficult task into manageable pieces where they can be successful, learn, and learn enough to take on the next most challenging piece. I also want to be an authentic leader. There's a great article written in 2006 in Harvard Business Review called Discovering Your Authentic Leadership. And the authors talk about the characteristics of leaders that people love to follow, and these characteristics they term authentic. Another one is to put the purpose of the team, the purpose of the project, the purpose of the organization over my own personal agenda. They matter more to me. Their work matters more to me. Their success matters more to me than my work, my role, my success. Now that's important because if you've ever worked with somebody who put personal agenda over purpose, you knew you couldn't trust them. Which leads us to the next one, which is trustworthy. As a trust ownership leader, I have to be trustworthy, which means I have to keep my commitments. If I tell somebody I'm gonna get it done, I better get it done. Because people trust people that have credibility. I have to build my credibility through delivery. And finally, if something goes wrong, and it always does, I blame and fix the process, not the person. This is important because if I blame the person, I'm assuming they're not trustworthy. If there's a mistake, in my mind I'm saying, that person meant to make a mistake. No. People come to do their best work. I want to create a culture where they want to do their best work. If they do their work and it doesn't and it fails, it's because the process or the system failed them, not them. That allows us to solve systemic problems, those I can solve, and those make life better for everybody. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this. If this seems like the right approach to leadership and to, exert, and to gaining influence, I want you to think of one thing you'll do differently that would improve culture in, or improve cult, trust in your relationships. I want you to think about it and commit that starting today, you'll do that one thing differently that'll improve trust in your relationships. Everyone got it? You've committed? 
you're ready to go forth and create trust, fantastic. Let's go on to ownership. So to create a culture of ownership, like I said, I want to be in the why and what business, but never be in the how business. My team owns how. There are a couple of ways to do that. First of all, start with why. Why is a powerful motivator, and sometimes if I'm really good at expressing why, I can let my team figure out what. So I don't even have to be in the what business anymore. And they certainly will then figure out the how. The other thing I want to do is push out decision making. I want them to own decisions. They're closer to the action than I am. Next, I want to never problem solve. If someone on my team comes to me with a problem and asks me how to solve it, and I tell them how to solve it, I just took their ownership away. Now, this is difficult. Pushing out decision making and never problem solving is difficult for me personally because I consider myself the greatest decision maker and the greatest problem solver in the history of mankind. And so if I follow what I'm saying, I'm going to take the two things I'm best at and stop doing those. And that's disconcerting. My decision making, my problem solving makes me unique and special and valuable. And now I'm telling myself to stop doing that. So what do I replace it with? Instead of being the world's great, greatest decision maker and problem solver, I want to be the world's greatest developer of decision makers and developers of problem solvers. So my whole team is as good at it as I think I am. So same or a similar assignment. What's one thing you will do differently in your role to create a culture of ownership? Think about it. One thing you'll do differently from what you do today that'll help create a culture of ownership, that'll get you out of the how business. Commit to doing it and do it. With that, my presentation is over. If you have any questions, I'll be here to answer those questions or outside. And if you want any more information, you'll see there at the bottom of that slide my email address. I'm happy to send you copies of articles, copies of chapters for my books. Trust ownership works. It changes cultures for the better. Purpose alignment works. It helps us identify the reason our organizations exist. It's that vision we heard about this morning that people can hold on to in times of rapid change. And with that, I thank you.